I got my first National Geographic grant 10 years ago, and thanks to that grant, now I help save the last wild places in the ocean. Barrington Irving, all of 23 years old, is hoping to be the youngest person to fly solo around the world and the first African American to do so. We're trying to address the shortage of youth pursuing careers in aviation. It doesn't matter where you're coming from, what you have, what you don't have. Anyone can achieve their dream. We teamed up with National Geographic to find demographically confirmed areas where people are living measurably longer. We can therefore also find a de facto formula for longevity. I'm not gonna be able to hold this. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Do you just break this to run its course? <laughs> I love freaks. Nature's oddballs are truly the most amazing animals on Earth. I just found my first frog! It's so exciting! I'm like part of the gang properly now. I'm a proper frog geek. You could come home with me and live in Hackney. Would you like that? The great thing about uh, one of the great things, there are many, about this panel tonight is the diversity they represent of the work of National Geographic. Exploration is not what it was 100 years ago. We explore in all areas, from flying an airplane around and using it to teach kids about science and math, studying the ugliest creatures on the planet, <laughs> studying the oceans, and for people like me, at this age, finding out where do humans live the longest? This is an urgent question at this stage <laughs> in my life. Dan Butner, who has written the book, The Blue Zones, about the places on the planet, and is it places that enable people to live longer than the average human? Well, we found five places. Essentially, we reverse, we, we reverse engineer longevity. So we found um, a place in the highlands of Sardinia, the Noral province, where there are more male 100-year-olds than any place else. That's where you'll want to retire. About 10 times as many. Uh, Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. Uh, if you go straight east of Los Angeles, about 80 miles, you exit at the Loma Linda um, exit off of Highway 10. The first thing you see is a Del Taco and a Wiener Hut. And you've arrived at America's Blue Zone. And that is the highest concentration of Seventh-day Adventists. And Adventists live about 10 years longer than the rest of us. So. Uh, my job was to try to piece together an explanation. How do they do it? And what are the lessons we can learn? It's one thing to live a long time, but are you happy while you're alive? He also knows the happiest places on the planet. But I was thinking of happy, you look at Enrique Sala. Now, he's a jovial guy, he's a smiling guy, but sometimes I think he's like the grim reaper of the ocean because he always is coming back telling me stories about the next coral reef that is dying. It must get depressing seeing what's happened in the oceans. So is that a story of throwing up your hands, or is there a story of hope in what you're doing? It's difficult to be optimistic. You know, when you think about conservation every day, when you think about what we are doing to the ocean and the planet in general, it's very frustrating. And it's, it's difficult to be optimistic. However, there are some bright spots out there. There are places that are so remote that they have, they have never been fished that look like the ocean 1,000 years ago. And there are also some marine reserves, these places that have been set aside without fishing, where marine life has come back. And when you dive in these places and you see the uh, capacity of the ocean to restore itself, to replenish itself, that gives you hope. Enrique Sala is one of our National Geographic Explorers and Residents. Lucy Cook is one of our newest emerging explorers, and she has set for herself a very difficult task, and that is trying to convince us that the ugly is cute. 
we're not talking about the homo sapiens species. You're, and you're saying, she's saying that there's too much attention uh, paid to the, the pandas and the polar bears. They, they're the poster children of conservation, and you want people to look at frogs and toads and other yeah. things. I've got nothing against the charismatic megafauna, you know. Mm -hmm. They're very charismatic animals, but I think that there are other animals out there that maybe need a little bit of a help, a bit of a, a PR boost, and that's what I feel like that's my job. All right, what's the ugliest creature you found that you're trying to, that you could put on a poster? Um, you can't say a fellow panelist. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a lovely um, frog that lives at the bottom of a, a lake in, in the Andes uh, that's called Talmatobius culius, which is Latin for aquatic scrotum frog. <laughs> and um, <laughs> mm. it, it, got, it got dealt a fairly raw deal in the PR stakes by whoever named it in the first place. And, uh, and, and what does that look like? He's quite, a he's, quite, he's, he's quite a saggy looking creature, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, but he's amazing. You know, he's got an amazing evolutionary story. He lives in a place that no amphibian should live. You know, he lives two and a half miles up in the air where it's freezing cold and there's intense UV light. Um, and he survives all that by living only at the bottom of the lake, and he never ever surfaces. And in order to do that, he's had to stop breathing air through his lungs and only breathe through his skin, which has evolved these copious folds, which increase the surface area, and he can just breathe through his skin. Which is, and, when, and ironically, when he's out of breath, what he does is press ups. To increase push, the push flow, ups here yeah, push-ups. Push up. Sorry, oh, sorry, but push-ups to increase the flow of um, water and therefore oxygen around his skin. So he really has a hard life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Barrington Irving, another of our emerging explorers, as you saw in the film, flying around in the plane, was trying to be, hoping to become, the youngest person to fly solo, pilot a plane solo, around the world, and become also the first African American to do that. This was when, 2007? Yep. 2007, started in March. How many days later, 97? It took me 97 days, 145 flight hours. And 20, what, 27,000 miles? Yes, correct. 27,000 miles you became yeah. at age 23. 23. So what happened? What got you into a cockpit? Because you were living in Miami? Yep. In a, what kind of neighborhood? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I grew up in one of the toughest neighborhoods in Miami between Carroll City and Liberty City. You know, one day I'm in a store minding my own business, and uh, this airline pilot walks up and says to me, hey, son, have you ever thought about becoming a pilot? And I looked at him crazy, and I told him I didn't think I was smart enough to fly a plane. And then I asked him how much money he made. After he answered the question, I took interest in becoming a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and well, how do you make that jump? It's one thing to be interested, but to go from that neighborhood where you were living, mm -hmm. what was the, the route? I mean, there are two pivotal things that he did. One, he provided me the opportunity to sit in the cockpit of a Boeing 777, and I uh, had the opportunity to play with all the buttons in the cockpit, and I said to myself, you know what, I think I can do this. And the second opportunity he provided me was to go flying in a small single-engine airplane just over my neighborhood. And that's when it hit me. It's like, oh my gosh, there's a world out there. And I was just flying over my neighborhood. And uh, that changed my life forever. I turned down a full football scholarship to pursue a career in aviation. Uh, to come back to what makes people happy, obviously he found something. Uh, Barrington found something that made him happy. Is that a key? Is it finding a purpose? Yeah, a purpose is a key. But actually the biggest determinant when, when we did this worldwide sort of meta-analysis of happiness around the world, uh, when you boil it all down, the, the, the cake ingredient with, that's most important in, in happiness is where you live. So if you are unhappy, the, the most powerful thing you can do is move to a happier place. So you take, for example, Moldavia, the former Soviet bloc, people as a rule are pretty unhappy there. Um, on a scale of one to 10, they rank about a three. But when you take Moldavian immigrants and move them to Copenhagen, Denmark, one of the happiest places in the world, within about a year, they start reporting the happiness level of their adoptive home. So if you want to get happier and you're not happy where you are, move. To Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> Denmark, not Washington. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, and a lot of people can't move, so there must be some other ingredients uh, uh, 
uh, does, does, and does some of this match longevity, uh, longevity uh, reasons? Yes. So if you are uh, unhappy, the effect of unhappiness on your health is as bad as a cigarette habit. It's worth, it cuts about eight years off of your life expectancy. But um, probably the biggest predictor of being happy is looking at a person's social network. Uh, the happiest people in the world socialize about six hours a day. And that's not Facebook, it's FaceTime. So if you have a, a half a dozen friends who you can call on a bad day, uh, and you regularly uh, socialize with them, that that's, uh, does more than just about anything to stack the deck in your favor. Uh, Lucy, does the scrotum frog have any friends? <laughs> He's extremely, he has one. <laughs> yeah, me. He needs, a, he needs two more friends. Um, <laughs> Fast. Uh, no, unfortunately, no. He's not got. He's not got that many friends. He's. 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 He's almost too popular in, in one unfortunate way. Is that he? When I eventually caught up with him, he was in. He was in a blender. Is that people believe that he. Um, he can, um, he's like a sort of backstreet Viagra in Peru. So, and they, this is serious. So he's got the they wrong actually... kinds of friends. He's got friends who want to drink him <laughs> in a fruit drink. It's pretty urgent because not only is he being drunk, but he's also the fu fungus that's killing off um, amphibians worldwide has actually arrived at uh, Lake Titicaca and is having and, a pretty um, devastating effect as well. What, maybe a little more than a third of the frog species are threatened now? 40% uh, actually. 40%, mm. yeah. And there's a little over 6,000 species, I think. Mm. So a huge number of frogs are being threatened at this stage, and Lucy's trying to tell that story mm. by finding ones with funny names and also <laughs> licking frogs. <laughs> Yeah, I did. I did lick a frog actually. I, I went to go. I went to Bogota. I was invited by some frogs. I wrote a blog about frogs for about six months, and I travelled around South America. And I got invited to Colombia by some frog scientists who read my blog, and um, and I went to go and visit them. And then I got there, and they were studying poison dart frogs. And they said, and the guy. Uh, uh, who's the sort of chief scientist, said that he went out, and the, when he was out in the field, he, he could figure out if a frog was poisonous or not by licking it, which I thought was the very definition of foolhardy. <laughs> it seemed like a completely crazy thing to do. So I did what he said, and I licked one. And uh, anyway, I had to lick him really hard, and then, and then nothing was happening. And then the sort of frog scientist said to me, he goes, you've got to, you've got to try hard, and you've got to agitate him. And he was, seemed quite agitated because he was making these little cheap, cheap noises, and I felt really bad. And uh, anyway, eventually, um, this huge, burning numbness like in Gulf, off my face, and I think I'd overdosed on it. <laughs> like, I think I'm the only person to come to Bogota and overdose on frog, but you know, there we go. Okay. <laughs> kids, kids, don't try this. Now. Yeah, don't try. Don't try to agitate a frog by yeah. licking it. Yeah. Now, Enrique, um, a huge percentage of the world's population lives along coastlines and depends on the ocean for their protein source. Their fishing is a big issue, and yet fishing is what is depleting much of the ocean. Can we have both? Yes, we can have both. So about half of the population lives near the coast, and seafood is the main source of animal protein for about a billion people. Uh, the problem is that we have this particular taste. On land, nobody would think of eating lions or tigers. These are the type of fish that we like to eat, the tuna, the large groupers, the sharks. So the ocean cannot support this level of consumption of the, of the top predators. And our footprint in the ocean is so large that we have basically run out of ocean. There are very few places only in the Southern Ocean and under the Arctic ice that have not been tapped by the fishing grounds. So there are solutions. And one is to eat cows instead of lions, to eat fish that are lower on the food chain, eat more mussels and oysters, which in addition of being farmed in a way that doesn't destroy the marine environment, they also clean the water and capture carbon. So they are a great carbon sink. And what we need to do in addition to that is to develop aquaculture that is sustainable. Because we moved from large scale hunting into agriculture thousands of years ago on, on the land. But in the ocean, we are still hunting. Fishing is not harvesting. Fishing is large-scale hunting. And we cannot, the ocean cannot uh, support uh, this level of consumption. So the, everybody is worried about peak oil. But we already 
reached peak fish in the late 80s. And the catch, the global catch of wild fish has been going down since. And in contrast, the amount of seafood that is produced by farms, by aquaculture, has been increasing. And now aquaculture provides about half of the seafood that we eat. And so aquaculture is on the rise, and global, you know, the wild fish catch is going down. So the only way we will be able to continue eating fish from the sea is through sustainable aquaculture, but in a way that doesn't deplete marine resources. And while you see the devastation that's happened in much of the ocean, you see the fish uh, stocks, the population that has declined, on the other side, we have put in uh, some marine reserves, small percentage of the ocean, but we have protected it. And it comes back faster than, than the land comes back when we protect an area. So that there is hope. It doesn't take long for fish to rebound. Oh, you know, it's absolutely spectacular that the recovery on, on this on this place. Actually, what got me into this business was, you know, when I was a kid, I was watching the documentaries of Jacques Cousteau on TV, and seeing all these whales and dolphins and sharks, and it was fantastic. And I was living on the Mediterranean coast of Spain, and I was I went swimming, and I didn't see any of that richness. <laughs> I say, wow, you know, this is something that belongs only to these tropical seas, and wow, these guys are so lucky to go to all these exotic places. Here, you know, it's just a little pond. And uh, until the day I dove for the first time in a marine reserve that had been protected for a few years, and everything that Custo showed us was there, the large groupers, the sea bream, the stingrays, in large numbers. And then I realized, wow, this is, this is incredible. You know, there is hope. Uh, we, if this works here in the Mediterranean, which is the most overfished sea on the planet, these protection measures, these marine reserves, should work everywhere. And there are so many fish inside these reserves, and they reproduce so much that part of them spills over. And after a few years, usually in in five years, the fishermen around these reserves are catching more than elsewhere. Barrington, you set the goal to fly around the world solo. You did it at 23, but that really was only one more beginning step in the journey because you decided, I need to give the same inspiration to other young people. And you started an academy. You have something called the STEM Academy to teach science and technology and engineering and math mm -hmm. and, and get kids involved in aviation, even building an airplane. Yeah. So how did that go? Well, I'm, I'm here to talk about it, and uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it was actually a, a phenomenal challenge uh, to take 60 kids, uh, mostly from failing schools in Miami, and challenge them to build a flyable aircraft from scratch, riveting the wings, figuring out the fuel system, um, the avionics, even making the seats that, that I sit in. And my challenge was to them was, if you build it, I'll fly it. And uh, these were kids between the ages of 13 and 18 years of age. And they built it in a remarkable 10 weeks. And uh, I put my life on the line in fluid. And <laughs> um, it, it, it honestly worked out to uh, true success. And now to this day, um, a young lady that was in our program, we've had a number of success stories, but a young lady in our program who can tell you where a 16th of an inch was on a ruler at that time, She's now a math major on a full scholarship at Duke University. So it's just the power, you know. Of the We've seen so much results. And uh, these students are not just pursuing aviation career fields, but you know, they're going into other fields related to science and math. And it's just all about exposure. And now you're going to take it to the next level yeah. worldwide. Yeah. And the plans are, what, next October? Next or a October. year from this coming October, yeah. you're going to launch a flying classroom. And, uh, and where are you going, who, who are you hoping to reach, and how are you going to do this? Well, what we're doing is we're transforming a uh, nine-passenger private jet into the world's first flying classroom, which will give us the ability uh, to travel to all seven continents, teach from the air, broadcast to students in classrooms or homes, um, be able to interview other explorers. And when I land in the different destinations, I'll join explorers and scientists in different parts of the world to highlight their work 
um, show their data and information, as well as collecting data and information from the air. And are kids going to follow along from schools yep. here in the United States? Yep. Uh, and, and all of this is virtual. All you need is internet connection and to be part of it. So we're, we're, I want to provide students the same experience I had when I met my mentor, but do it on a larger scale. Uh, through virtual technology and highlighting pioneers such as these guys here um, along the journey to really inspire them and show them what's out there. It's their world and they need to know, you know, they play a key part in shaping their future. Lucy has done something that's made millions of people smile. I don't know how happy it's made them. She put together a video on sloths and it's gone viral. How many have looked at it now? Um, that, that one particular video is probably being watched by over 7 million people, wow. maybe more. Yeah. It's called Meet the Sloths. If you want to go to YouTube, you can find it. It's, it's better quality on Vimeo, but yeah. Vimeo. Go to Vimeo. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's just pictures of sloths. It's, yeah, they are. Being cute. They are. They're, well, they're, 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 they've been quite snoozy and sort of goofy and slothy, you know. <laughs> um, and this it, is part of the story of telling animals that don't get their mm. profile. Put out. Yeah, sloths have had a reputation for being lazy, dirty, and stupid, and and, and derided for being for, for being for being lazy. And the thing that sort of really fascinates, or sort of annoys me, and why I want to sort of let everyone know is that there's that there's nothing great about being fast. <laughs> you know, being slow is a fantastic evolutionary strategy, and the sloth is really successful animal. They are very they're like stealth ninjas, basically. <laughs> uh, they. Um, they move so fast you don't even see them moving. Well, they actually, they're, they're, they're major their major predator is the harpy eagle. Um, and it's thought that they move so slowly that they actually, move, the movement goes under the radar of the harpy eagle. It's like, you know, flying above the trees and, and the sloth moving really slowly. And it's totally disguised as a tree, you know, because it's got um, two species of algae and uh, like 200 species of insect in its fur, which is how they got the reputation of being dirty. Did you um, lick a sloth, by the way? <laughs> I, I, do you know what? I, I, I draw the line at licking a sloth, actually, yeah. It's a great video. Well, I like the fact that uh, Lucy's taken the second half of inspiring people to care about the planet, which we want to see how they're all doing this. Uh, you find out the information, but then you've got to inspire people. So how do you reach people? How do you reach the young people, these uh, kids? And how do you reach the rest of us? One way is put up a video that makes 6 million, 7 million people check it out on YouTube. Is mm. that the new way to communicate? Well, definitely. I mean, you can't ignore um, the internet. I mean, it's, I think it's fantastic. I mean, I, I it's you know, I, I totally embraced uh, the internet because it's enabled me to broadcast to an almost you know infinite audience using a mobile phone. You know, that's all you need now. We all have the power to be broadcasters and tell our stories, which I think is is really empowering and really fantastic thing. You know, when I was a kid, you know, I, I could only dream, you know, a video camera would have cost tens of thousands of dollars even, and there's no hope of editing it, you know. So now it's so exciting that you can reach these audiences. Um, can so you give as much information in yeah. the, because you can't put, you can't put a, Half hour documentary on you. Nobody will watch the whole half hour. So, how long no. was their sloth film? Well, my, yeah, no, that sloth video doesn't give any information. It's it's only that ninety seconds long. But I, where I place it, it, it then draws in an audience. I think so. There are people like oh sloths, and then they might read more <laughs> about the you know my website. I've got a, um, I started up the Sloth Appreciation Society actually um, to reclaim the sloth as the true king of the jungle. Um, and um, so I've got lots of information there about their. Biology and, and I've written books and I've made documentaries which go into the story further, but it's about sort of like drawing an audience in that might not necessarily have come to a conservation program. You know, it, it, it's about <coughs> preaching to a wide audience, for me, anyway. And Dan has found uh, another way to get people involved, and that's to get entire cities to try to follow some of the rules that you have learned about what makes people healthier and live longer, and try it as an experiment is an entire city. You're doing this in Minnesota? And well, I'm doing Minnesota, Los Angeles, now the whole state of Iowa is trying to become a blue zone, believe it or not. We got another grant from National Geographic, the Explorer Council, to actually find parts of the world that were unhealthy and got healthier. And there's only two in the world. Uh, we found one in, in uh, Scandinavia, 145,000 people in 1970 had the highest rate of uh, heart disease in the world, and they brought it down by 80% and they maintained it for uh, about 30 years. And um, cardiovascular disease is about a, 
uh, $500 billion a year problem in America. The way they did it, the secret, was to not rely on individual responsibility. They didn't nag you to get out of the, uh, get out from in front of the TV, uh, or eat your vegetables, or get your exercise. They changed the environment. And we started in Elbert Lee, Minnesota, and we blue zoned it. And in 18 months, we brought down their healthcare costs by about 40%. It actually worked. And then Los Angeles brought us in, and uh, beginning next month, we start with our first four cities in, in Iowa. How long has the experiment been going on in that first city in Minnesota? It's, st it's three years. It's on its third year now. And it's still working. It's still working. They're now. sticking with the plan. Yes. Yeah. It, it's an evolving blueprint, but uh, essentially, we put into place little things that move a population one or two percent. Like, for example, you prohibit drive through in fast food places. Fewer people eat fast food, there's less idling, so the air's a little bit cleaner. Uh, you put a policy in place in schools forbidding kids to eat in hallways and classrooms, and the BMI of that class goes down by 11%. You don't even have to touch the 900 pound grill. So we have 110 of those little things. And we don't make the city do it, we say, Here's the portfolio. You choose the 60 or 70 you want to do. We'll help you implement them over the next couple years. We use Gallup to measure on the front end, and we measure on the back end, and our feet are held to the fight. We don't get paid unless, unless we make the population healthier. So, A great program. And that's what National Geographic is trying to do. Find out information, bring it back, share it, inspire people, and then hope that they will take that message and do something that either changes the planet or changes themselves individually. And that is the purpose of National Geographic, as we say, once again, our message to inspire people to care about the planet and then to do something once you know what the challenges are to try to solve the problems. There are answers. There are zones that we can put up, choices we can make, so that the almost 200,000 years of Homo sapiens doesn't have to end in a story of extinction. Thank you.